Welcome to the YouTube channel, Professor Wilcox, where today we finish 4.5, part two, the real zeros of polynomial functions. So to start 4.5, part two, I wanna first start by talking to you about the rational zeros theorem. And in order, some books, by the way, we'll call this the rational root theorem. These are the same thing because zeros and roots are the same thing. Uh, I want to give you a function. Let's call this a fourth degree polynomial function. Just, just to see what this thing might look like. Let's call this x to the fourth plus 3x to the third minus 12x squared plus 10x minus 10. I think most of us would agree that we know that the degree is 4 which means that we have four roots at most, and we have four factors. And those factors may look something like this. We don't really know what those factors would be, but I do know that if I were to factor it out, they would look something like this. I don't know how to factor a fourth degree polynomial, but I do know that all of these factors are gonna pretty much represent the same thing, where the first times first times first times first is gonna give me my first term or my leading term. In this case, would be x times x times x times x, because x multiplied by itself four times is really gonna give you x to the fourth. The 10 that's here at the end is really gonna be the last times the last times the last times the last. Now there's a lot of possibilities here for this 10, right? I could have five times two times one times one. I could have one times one times 10 times one. I could have two times one times five times one. There's a lot of possibilities here. What I do know is that all of these factors are always gonna be in pretty much the same form. And those forms are gonna be qx minus p. Now this is just the general version of qx minus p for all these, right? So I do know that I have four of these factors. And when I multiply all these out, I get that fourth degree polynomial. So here's what I know. If I take, let's go back up here to the definition. If I take qx minus p, which is the general form of all my factors, and I set it equal to zero, to solve for x, I could take this p to the other side, and then I could divide by q. All of my factors are gonna come in the form of p divided by q. This is gonna be the form of all the roots. Now, what else do I know about this? The p, or the number that's on the top, is always gonna be the value that's at the end or the constant. And if I multiply p times p times p times p, in this case that I gave you, we would have to get negative 10. And so what we need to note here is that p is a list of the factors of the constant. So p is a list of the factors of the constant. Also in the same token, qx times qx times qx times qx would have to give me that first term out there, which means that q is a list of the factors, I'm gonna squeeze this in here, of the leading coefficient. Now, in the case that I gave you, my leading coefficient is one because there's a one out here in the front, so it'll be one x times one x times one x times one x, right? And But in those cases, I can multiply all this together to get the leading term. Now, here's the idea. The list of all possible rational roots are gonna come in the form plus or minus p divided by plus or minus q. And we're gonna think of all the possibilities that we could have here. So let's do this on this example that we have here. Plus or minus p, remember p is a list of the factors of the constant, my constant is 10. There are only four factors of 10, plus or minus one and plus or minus 10, I can normally start with that. And then plus or minus two and plus or minus five. So when I said to you all the possibilities of P, I could have 10 times one times one times one or two times one times one times five and all those possibilities, those are the only numbers that I could possibly plug in here for P because I have a 10 as my constant. On the bottom, I have plus or minus Q. In my example, I have a one. So I'm really just dividing everything by plus or minus one, which doesn't change anything. So of a list of all the possible rational roots is just gonna be plus or minus one, plus or minus 10, plus or minus two, and plus or minus five. There are eight possibilities. Let's try that again with a different leading coefficient and see what happens. Here's g of x, three x to the third, minus 17 x squared, 
plus 11x minus 12. So the first, this is a 17, which really doesn't matter because it's the terms that are in the middle. I want to make a list of all of the p-values. So all the factors of the constant. Well, 12 is an interesting number because I could do plus or minus 1, plus or minus 12. I could then move to 2, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 6, because 2 times 6 is 12. And finally, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 4. Now, I also have a 3 out here in the back. So I want to make a list of all of my factors of Q. In this case, it's really just going to be 3 and 1, so I'll list this as plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3. And so what I have to do is I have to make a list of all the possibilities of all of the plus or minus P's divided by the plus or minus Q's. So over here, we're going to make our list. If I take all of my original P values and put them on top of 1, those numbers are not going to change, so I'm just going to rewrite those. Then I need to take my other values that are not 1, in this case 3, and put them over or put them under all of my p-values. So if I have plus or minus 1 over plus or minus 3, we can simply write that as plus or minus 1 third. Plus or minus 2 over plus or minus 3, I'm just going in numerical order, plus or minus 2 thirds. Now plus or minus 3 over plus or minus 3 is really 3 over 3, which is 1, but I've already included that in my list. So we don't have to count things twice. Plus or minus 4 over plus or minus 3, I can write as plus or minus 4 thirds. Plus or minus 6 divided by plus or minus 3 is plus or minus 2. I already have that. And plus or minus 12 divided by plus or minus 3 is plus or minus 4. I already have that. So this is an exhaustive list of all of the possible rational roots, and those are listed here. So as an example, we're going to find all of the rational roots using the rational root test. Let me give you a function. h of x is going to be 3x to the 5th plus 2x to the 4th minus 3x minus 2. Okay, so I do know that I have five possible real roots. I know there are five roots. Uh, there are five potential real roots. Let's make our list. I'm first going to start with my list of the factors of the constant. In this case, is 2. So it's going to be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2. My leading coefficient is a 3. So I need to put all these values over plus or minus 3. So in this case, it's going to be plus or minus 1 third, and then plus or minus 2 thirds. So there are eight possible rational roots for this function here. Now, what we can do in order to make this easy on ourselves is we can have the calculator guide us. In this case, I'm going to take 3x to the 5th. I'm going to type that in the calculator here. Plus 2x to the 4th minus 3x minus 2. And if I graph this thing, I'm going to go back to my standard window, zoom 6. Not a whole lot I can tell here, but it looks like maybe it crosses the axis at 1. And so what we can do is we can take 1, which is my root, and we can think of if I divide this into my original polynomial, I can check to see if I get a remainder. So my x to the fifth is a 3. My x to the fourth is a 2. x to the third, x squared, I need 0, 0. And then minus 3, minus 2. This is a confirmation for my hunch. If I take the 3 and drop it down, multiply around 1 times 3 is 3. Add those together, 2 plus 3 is 5. Multiply around 1 times 5 is 5. Add them up is 5. Multiply is 5. Add them up is 5. Multiply is 5. Add them up is 2. Multiply is 2, and we have no remainder. So it turns out that 1 is one of my roots of the polynomial. Okay, And if I look at my graph again, I could really keep going. And it might be, is there maybe a negative one there? What we can do is I can take the negative one and long divide it or synthetic divide it into what's left. Because if you think about it, if I have the number 72 and I long divide that into 6, right? 6 into 7, 1 times 6 minus that's 12. That goes twice. I have no remainder, right? I could say if I can then divide a 2 into the 12, right? Or I can long divide a 2 into the 12 that's here. Since 2 goes into 12 six times, I can also assume that 2 also goes into 72. So let's do this here and see what happens. 3 drops down. Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Add them up is 2. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. Add them up is 3. 
Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Add them up is 2. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. Add them up is 0. If I take my calculator and I look, I can zoom in just a little bit. So here's, here's the 1 that I found. There's the negative 1 that I found. What is this number here? If this is 0 and this is negative 1, this one might be, I don't know, negative 1 half, maybe past negative 1 half. Well, wait a minute. I do have negative 2 thirds on my list. And what I can do is I can synthetic divide negative 2 thirds into that to see if this is going to come out correct. Let's check. My 3 drops down. Negative 2 thirds times 3. The 3's cancel. That's negative 2. 2 and negative 2 is 0. Negative 2 thirds times 0 is 0. Add them up is 3. Negative 2 thirds times 3 is a negative 2, and I get no remainder. So that works. So these are two more roots that I found. It turns out that if I now think of what's left, the 3 and the 0 and the 3, originally I started with a 5th degree polynomial. I went down by 1. This is a 4th degree polynomial. I went down by 1. This is a 3rd degree polynomial. And I went down by 1. This is a 2nd degree polynomial. So this represents 3x squared. This is my linear term x, and this is my constant 3. If I set this thing equal to 0, I'll do this up here for room, if I have 3x squared plus 3 equals 0, I could subtract 3 from both sides like this. 3x squared equals negative 3. Divide both sides by 3. So now x squared equals negative 1. And if I then take the square root, we may have learned in Algebra 2 that the square root of negative 1 is plus or minus i. So those are my two remaining roots. And look at what we have here. We have a fifth degree polynomial with one, two, three real roots that we found, and we have confirmed them because they have all given us no remainder. And there are two complex roots here. So three plus two is five. We have five roots total, and we have just found uh, all of the rational roots. We're gonna find all of the rational roots of the following function. 2x to the 4th minus 15x to the 3rd plus 23x squared plus 15x minus 25. All right, so let's make our list of all of the potential real rational zeros. My factors of my constant are 25. So we're going to write this as plus or minus 1, plus or minus 5, and plus or minus 25. All right, I then need to take all of these values and put them over plus or minus q, which is going to be factors of my leading coefficient 2. So I have plus or minus 1 with a 2 on the bottom, that's 1 half, plus or minus 5 halves, and plus or minus 25 halves. All right, and so now I can look at my calculator to see if this is going to give us some information here. Let me clear this out. 2x to the fourth minus 15x cubed plus 23x squared plus 15x minus 25. Graph it. Well, it looks like I have, all right, we got a couple things going on here. We got a negative one and we have a positive one. Now, I want you to be sure that we actually synthetic divide this through because what if this was negative 0.99? Right, I could have a, a root that's very close to one, but not exactly one. What if this is 0.99 or 1.0003, something very, very close to one? So I actually have to synth synthetic divide those to see if this is going to work. Let's take the negative one and see if we get no remainder. My coefficients are 2, negative 15, 23, 15, and negative 25. All right, so we're going to draw our line. We're going to drop this down to negative one times two is negative two. Add them up is negative 17. And that's positive 25, which gives me no remainder. So that's very, very good. I also notice that I have a positive 1 here. So let's also do a positive 1 into this thing and see what happens. Drop down the 2. And I have no remainder. Now think about this. I now I started off with a fourth degree polynomial. Down by 1 is 3. Down by 1 is 2. So this really represents a 2x squared minus 15x plus 25. I now could take this and factor it. 
and that would give me my two remaining factors because I know that I have a total of four factors. Let's see if this is factorable. 2x squared is going to be 2x times 1x. 25 is going to be 5 times 5. And my 25 is positive, which means my signs are the same. My middle term is negative, so this is going to be a minus and a minus. So now what I have here is two more factors that I found with the two factors that we got from our list and confirmed with no remainder. A factor of negative 1 or a root of negative 1 means that x plus 1 is a factor. And a root of positive 1 means that x minus 1 is a factor. So this is what we have called before as factored form. So I've figured out how to factor a fourth degree polynomial, right? And then I can make a list of the roots, which is also called a list of the zeros. These are the same, which is going to be plus or minus 1. We found those here. I factored out the x minus 5, so a positive 5 is a factor. And for this one, remember we have a 2 out in the front. So if I were to set this equal to 0, and you're allowed to just kind of do this in your head, if you take the 5 to the other side and put the 2 on the bottom, my remaining factor would be 5 halves. I think if I look back on the calculator and I check other parts of the graph that 5 and 5 halves, if I do a zoom 6, that will take me back to standard. So there's my four roots here. So I have my negative 1 here. I have my positive 1 there. This is 1, 2, 3. So this is the 2.5, or 5 halves that I found. 3, 4, 5, and there's my root of 5. So all of those factors are confirmed by the calculator. The last thing that I want to talk to you about today... ...is called the Intermediate Value Theorem. And I want to explain this to you with a picture. A lot of things are uh, easily understood by a picture diagram. So I think if we have, like... Uh, a little curve that starts here and kind of goes through something like this. If this is my origin, kind of bring this down like with a little line, this is a value called a, right? And my a is really the x value of the function, okay? This distance that goes down to the point is going to be my function evaluated at a. Let's call that f of a. And likewise, if I kind of brought this down over here, if this is the x value b, then this y value, or how high this point is, is going to be f of b. And here's what the interme intermediate value theorem says. If f of a and f of b are of opposite signs, then there must be a real root between them. And let me explain to you what this means. Since in this picture diagram, f of a is negative, that is, it's below the x-axis, and f of b is positive, that is, it's above the x-axis, doesn't somewhere, doesn't that mean that somewhere in between these two points, in between a and b, it has to cross through at least once? Now, this could come back down and then come back up. I would have three roots. But there must be at least one real root between them. And when I say between them, I mean between a and b. So somewhere between these two x values, it has to cross the x-axis because one of my values is negative, one of my values is positive. And the same would be true is if these were opposite. This one were uh, positive. This is above the x-axis and this one's negative. It has to cross somewhere between those, between those values. So let's look at this and see what this means. I'm going to give you a function. f of x equals x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 2x minus 6. So what we're going to do is we're going to show that there is a root between 2 and 3. That's the goal for this question. And so what I need to do here is just realize my 2 and my 3 are really my a and my b values uh, from the diagram here, right? So if 2 and 3 are here, if I can show that these two values give me a positive and negative y value or of opposite signs, then I've done my job. So if we evaluate f of 2 here, right, this is going to be 2 to the 4th power minus 5 times 2 squared plus 4 minus 6. Just evaluating my 2 into my function. Well, 2 to the 4th power is 16. 2 squared is 4 times 5 is a minus 20. And then plus 4 minus 6 comes down. Well, 16 minus 20 is negative 4 plus 4 is 0. This is a negative number. If I can then evaluate my function at positive 3 and show that it's a positive number, I have then proven that there is going to be a real root between 2 and 3 somewhere. 
I'm gonna take three, raise that to the fourth power, minus five times three squared, plus two times three minus six. Well, three to the fourth power is three times three times three times three, which is 81. Minus three squared is nine times five is 45, plus six minus six. Well, these are canceled. And 81 minus 45 is 41 minus five, which is 36. I have shown the problem to be true. Since my y value evaluated at two is negative and my y value evaluated at three is positive, there has to be a root between them. So the answer here is going to be yes. I hope this has been helpful for you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact me on Remind or through email or find me in room 312. Thank you very much.